Um, our next paper is from um, Harish Tarbidi, former professor of English at the University of Delhi, who uh, has been a visiting professor at the University of Chicago and London. He's published in the areas of modern British fiction, post-colonial theory, translation studies, and comparative literature. Uh, his, perhaps his best known work in our field is his editing of Kipling's Kim for uh, Roger Kipling's Kim for Penguin Classics in 2011. He's also contributed articles to books on Kipling, including Kipling and Beyond, Patriotism, Globalization, and Postcolonialism, uh, 2009, The Cambridge Companion to Kipling, uh, 2011, and In Time's Eyes, Essays on Rudyard Kipling, 2013. He is currently co-editing with Jan Montefiore a book of essays on Kipling in India, India in Kipling, which was the conference I spoke at in, in uh, Shimla. He's also a contributing editor of a project based in Stockholm for writing a history of world literature. Ambitious man. Um, <coughs> very, very sadly, uh, uh, greetings in, in Delhi. Um, he is housebound under doctor's orders today, um, f uh, suffering from a viral fever. So he has to rest for a week. So I'm afraid we asked him to uh, write up his paper and I'm, it's fallen me to read it to you. So I'll try to do my best impression. And um, rather than have you look at uh, a photograph, we've put together some uh, PowerPoint, some images, which um, I hope, Harish, you, you enjoy back home. Uh, so <coughs> I'll just read his paper to you. Of the multifarious legacies of Lockwood Kipling that the exhibition and this symposium celebrate, it could be argued that the most intimate the most influential and the most consequential was the personal legacy he bequeathed to his one and only son, Rudyard Kipling. In fact, it may be best to begin by acknowledging that Lockwood Kipling was known, pri was known primarily as the father of Rudyard Kipling until this exhibition was mounted, I, I'm, <laughs> except in Lahore, of course. Um, and and uh, then he says some wonderful things about the book and the exhibition, which I just leave all that out. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the child is father of the man, wrote Wordsworth, but in the present case, we may modify that to say that the child was the father of the father, in the sense that if we did not know the child, we may not have known about the existence of the father. This was, in fact, true even in the arts and craft circles, and even in Lockwood's own time. For example, the journal American Art News, in its issue for 4th February 1911, carried a brief notice of Lockwood Kipling, which ran as follows. Obituary, John L. Kipling, father of Rudyard Kipling, died last Sunday at his home in Wiltshire, England. He was 74 years old and well known as an artist, sculptor and author. Rudyard, the son, remains even now the elephant in the room of... Harish is a very funny man, I promise you. <laughs> I'm, I, I haven't got his delivery, um, and he was going to ad-lib all this anyway. Uh, the elephant in the room of Lockwood's life, but I wish to argue that to acknowledge this is not to diminish Lockwood's importance, but rather to enhance it. As an old Sanskrit verse has it, one should desire to win everywhere, but wish for defeat against one's son and one's student. Totally agree. <laughs> And throughout Lockwood's life, Rudyard remained not only a fond son, but perhaps an even fonder disciple of his father. I won't uh, tell you what these are, because you can read uh, from the captions. The relationship between Lockwood and Rudyard appears to have been an especially happy, harmonious, and mutually en enriching one. In this presentation, I propose firstly to enumerate the seven great gifts that Lockwood bequeathed to Rudyard, which made the son the person he became, then we'll look at three specific instances of creative collaboration between son and father. I conclude with a brief reflection on their respective attitudes to India and the British Empire. So, the seven gifts. Number one. To state an obvious but vital fact, Lockwood gave Rudyard the gift of life by fathering him. No more need be said on this issue, except that Lockwood's wife, Alice, had an equal role in the outcome. <laughs> Two, uh, Lockwood gave Rudyard the gift of India. Though Rudyard was conceived in England, he was born in India, 30th December 1865. His parents had travelled to India shortly after marrying for the reason, apparently, that Lockwood could not afford to keep a wife on the salary he was paid by his employer 
in England, uh, the South Kensington Museum, the V&A, how things have changed. He even, he did, sorry, didn't, he didn't write that. He went east, therefore, to seek a living, if not a fortune, as numerous Englishmen had done before him. And he did find a decent enough living, for he could employ several servants, including a bearer, a groom, a nanny, and uh, the ayah, uh, ayah for little Ruddy, who also served initially as wet nurse. From all accounts, including Rudyard's own in his autobiography, Something of Myself, he was, as a toddler and as a little boy, supremely happy and pampered no end by this devoted retinue, and that too in a very Indian way, so much so that he seems to have spoken much of the time in the vernacular, the language of the native servants, and in English only when being presented to his parents to say good night to them, <laughs> be before being put to bed, where again he was told bedtime stories in the vernacular, in a lively oral mode by one of the servants. 3. After this idyllic childhood, Lockwood next gave his son Rajard the gift of an unhappy boyhood which of course is commonly regarded as a great boon for gifted writers. At the age of five, Rajard was separated from India and his parents and sent with his sister to England to live in the foster care of a couple he did not know for the next six years. This was to save him from the possibility and temptation of going native and was a practice universally adopted by English parents in India, also for their children's health. The deep misery Rajard experienced on being abandoned to what he called a house of desolation was evoked by him a decade later in one of his most intense and moving pieces of autobiographical fiction, the short story Bar Bar Black Sheep. Lockwood and his wife Alice had, of course, not meant to inflict such a trauma on their sensitive son, but were greatly shocked now to find what he had gone through, though after Rajard had got this cathartic piece of writing out of his system, all of them seemed gradually to have got better reconciled to the episode. Four, after Rudyard had finished school in England at the age of 16, Lockwood gave Rudyard the gift of freedom as an adolescent by not sending him to university. This is Rudyard age 17 with his moustache on the left and I think 18 or 19 on, a little later on the right. So he didn't, uh, this was, he didn't go to university because his father couldn't afford the university fees. He may have been well-to-do by Indian standards with all those servants, but when converted to pound sterling, his salary didn't go far enough. Had Rajard actually gone to Oxford, as Lockwood had hoped and done well, he may at best have become a member of the ICS, the elite Indian civil service. He would then not have written possibly any poems or novels at all, and certainly not written as many poems or stories as he did, pillaring ignorant and incompetent members of the ICS, <laughs> in the writing of some of which his father merrily lent a hand. Five, in the lack of a, in his, the lack of a university education, Rudyard seemed to have few prospects in life. Lockwood then gifted him a job and a roof over he, his head. He did this by calling his 16-year-old son back to India, where, and I had to slightly correct um, the paper here, where, he, where Rudyard first worked in the museum as, as a curator, as deputy curator, he, he writes in his autobiography, uh, for six weeks. So he's actually a great loss to the museum profession. He could have been a real curator rather than being a hack writer, no. Um, <laughs> his parents find, found him a job in a local newspaper. And Lockwood had Rudyard stay with him in his own large house, thus making up what they called the family square, comprising father, mother, the prodigal son, now returned to its bosom, and his younger sister, Trix, who was too back from school in England and wanted waiting to be married off. It may have been unusual by British standards to have a grown-up and employed son staying with his parents, but it was quite the norm among Indians, so it was all right. Often, the British in India did just as the Indians did. Six, Rudy Rudyard's job in India was a, as a journalist on a British paper, and it could be suggested that this was made possible because Lockwood and his wife Alice gifted him their writing genes. Lockwood had been writing occasional reports and columns for a sister newspaper in India almost ever since Rudyard was born. His wife Alice wrote similar occasional columns too, and Rudyard's younger sister Trix wrote comic poems like the rest of the family. In fact, the Kipling family quartet produced at, um, I think that was in the previous slide, yeah, um, uh, 1885, a, a volume of poems and short stories 
to which they all contributed, running to 124 pages, titled Quartet. This sense of a, a writerly family um, camaraderie is caught well by Marie, Mary Hamer, former president of the Kipling Society, uh, in her novel uh, from 2012, Kipling and Tricks, in, it, in which Rudyard's younger sister shows off at school by saying, and this is a, a, an invented quote, in my family, everyone writes. Mama even does the notes from Simla for the, pa for the paper on top of all her poetry. And Papa's always sending off learned articles. Even my brother Ruddy, who's not much older than I am, works on a newspaper. End of quote. But this bit of childlike bragging seems modest in retrospect, for even my brother Ruddy, the young journalist, turned out to be one of the greatest and most popular of all English poets and novelists and tricks, who makes no claim on her own behalf, went on to publish two novels of her own, which remain sadly neglected. Thus, if Rudyard became a great writer, some of the credit should go to the Kipling genes and heredity, and some more perhaps to the environment of the Kipling family in India in the 1880s, when all of them uh, were scribbling away together. So, um, seven, la uh, lastly, Lockwood remained, for as long as he lived, the go-to man for his <coughs> son, Rudyard back to that one, for information about everything Indian. He gave Rudyard the gift of himself as a living encyclopedia. Lockwood lived and worked for 28 years in India, compared with Rudyard's seven, that is, four times as long. But his, knowledge, but his knowledge of India seems to have been about 10 times greater than his son's. Rudyard was a journalist and a sub-editor, sometimes roving but often desk-bound, and remains a jack of all trades. Lockwood, in his job as a teacher, successively at two art schools and of arts and crafts, and the principal of one of them, and the curator of the Lahore Museum, he gained specialist knowledge and cutting-edge expertise in his chosen area. Moreover, the condition and circumstances of Lockwood's daily occupation in India helped him acquire a wider and deeper understanding of India than Rudyard. For one thing, he worked day in, day out with Indian colleagues and students, while Rudyard's peers and colleagues at both the newspapers he worked on were all English. It is significant that, that in all the six volumes of the, of the collected letters of Rudyard Kipling, there is not a single Indian correspondent. Lockwood, on the other hand, had fellow masters in his school of arts and crafts who were all Indian, yeah. um, and a couple of them were evidently his equals in ability, if not abler. Practicing traditional and often inherited Indian skills and the various arts and crafts, they were on home ground, while Rudyard's Indian subordinates in the newspaper office, such as office clerks and press operators, were segregated as, as being blue-collar workers uh, and who knew little English. In contrast, Lockwood's colleagues stood with him on the level and their abilities as visual artists were there for all to see. One of them, Sher Mohammed, we saw some of his paintings earlier, painted a portrait of Lockwood in 1907, which is the best ever painted of him. And there are two of them, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, one in the museum and one in the art school in Lahore, as the de defining portraits of Lockwood. Another Indian colleague, Bairam Singh, you see on the right here, eventually succeeded Lockwood as the principal of the Mayo School of Art in Lahore. Meanwhile, he played a major supporting role when Lockwood was awarded two royal commissions between 1899 and 1893, the first to design and furnish in the Indian style a billiard room at the residence of the Duke of Connaught at Bagshot, and then on Queen Victoria's admiring it to do a grander Durbar Hall, a room of royal audience, in her own home at Osborne. Lockwood executed each commission in close collaboration with Bairam Singh. Queen Victoria, after a visit to Bagshot, referred to the beautiful Indian room there as having been designed by Ram Singh, making no mention at all of Lockwood. And when her own house was being done, Ram Singh was invited to come and work in England for one month, but ended up staying for two years to take the major responsibility for designing and executing the assignment, while Lockwood for much of this time was back in India. During this period, Queen Victoria seems to have taken a bit of a shine to Ram Singh, as she earlier had to another Indian working for her, her Munshi, the Indian clerk Abdul Karim, a relationship portrayed in, in the new British-American film Victoria and Abdul. <laughs> 
And you know, when I used to work at Osborne and I talk about Abdul Karim, I referred people to um, the film um, Mrs. Brown uh, with Judy Dench. And I used to joke, one day there'll be a film, <laughs> Mrs. Abdul. And here we are. Yeah. Um, so maybe one day there'll be a film called Mrs. Byram Singh. Um, it's possible. Anyhow, you heard it first here. Sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, what these episodes show is that Lockwood's experience and knowledge of India was far more extensive, deep, intimate, collegial, and egalitarian than Rudyard's. To his credit, Rudyard not only knew and acknowledged this fact, but also exploited it by tapping his father's superior knowledge and wisdom as and when he pleased. This brings us to the next and final part of my presentation, in which I will substantiate three selected examples of the creative collaboration between father and son, and then conclude with a grand but mercifully brief post-colonial comparison between the two. Lockwood and Rudyard, Collaboration and Comparison. In the seven years Rudyard spent in India working as a journalist, he published seven volumes of poems and short stories which are all about India and which laid the foundation of his lasting fame. In March 1889 he left India for good, but for a brief, but for a brief visit a couple of years later. His next collection of short stories, which was probably his best ever single collection, was published in 1891. It was titled Life's Handicapped, Being Sto Stories of Mine Own People. Its 27 stories were set in India, and at the end of a long and disingenuous preface, the narrator claimed that these were all stories he had been told by other people, including priests, carvers, carpenters, and women spinning in their cottages. He then adds, Rajard adds, and a few, but these are the very best, my father gave me, unquote. In the midst of all his artful feigning, this direct and unadorned acknowledgement signals that Lockwood remained a constant source book for Rajard's Indian knowledge and creativity. I mean, as an aside, one could call Lockwood the father of the Jungle Book, perhaps. The second kind of collaboration between father and son began when Lockwood, as an artist, undertook to illustrate his son's books. This had started while Rajard was still in India, with Lockwood drawing the covers of his six books of poetry and fiction that Rajard published together in 1889. Ah, that's the Jungle Book. In the 1890s, Lockwood famously illustrated the two Jungle Books published in 1894 and 1895, and these illustrations became everyone's idea of what the Indian jungle and its inhabitants looked like for generation after generation. Then, in 1901, Lockwood also illustrated Rudyard's masterpiece, Kim, with ten plates illustrating most of the major characters, singly or in a group. These are probably the illustrations he is best known for, though he provided hundreds of others for Rudyard's other books, and for his own book, Beast and Man in India, 1891, and also for books by other authors on Indian subjects. Apparently, Lockwood, wanting to do his best for his son, have I gone on to the next one? Sorry, no, yes. Apparently, Lockwood, wanting to do his best for his son, devised an entirely new technique for Kim and for some of Rudyard's other books, which played to his own strength, while he thought, which he thought was not drawing, but modelling in, in clay. He would model in deep relief the figure to be illustrated, and then it would be photographed for use in the book. Elizabeth James, in the book of our exhibition, says that no other artist ever followed Lockwood in adopting this technique, and it's not difficult to see why. Um, <laughs> Harish writes, in my own non-specialist opinion, the new technique gave the illustrations a thick-set, heavy and somber quality, underlining bulk and corporeality, rather than suggesting the spirit and the essence of the character. In comparison, Lockwood's 80-odd illustrations for his own book, Beast and Man in India, 1891, done by the old method of sketching, are markedly lively and on occasion even humorous, as the one which shows a cheetah and his owner sleeping in the same bed and tugging at dif different ends of the sheet with which they are trying to cover themselves. This is entirely in the spirit of the final incident narrated in the book, for some reason not illustrated, in which a tiger escapes from the Lahore Zoo and goes ambling along the main street of the city, the Mall. When his keeper finds out, he comes running after the tiger, 
admonishes him severely and makes him turn around and then they walk back to the zoo together with the keeper all the while lecturing the tiger on the gravity of his misdemeanor. Uh, Lockwood wrote this, only this one book rather than any on the arts and crafts of India, but it was a happy choice for it embodies in ample measure the extensive knowledge of India in its many aspects that his son and others valued in him. He knows all about the birds and beasts of India and he also seems to know the place they occupy in the lives of common Indians and in their imagination. Within one paragraph, for example, Lockwood cites a dozen proverbs prevalent in the different regions and languages of India relating to cocks, hens and chicks. A little later he mentions how the peacock is the vahana of the god Kartikeya and also of the goddess Saraswati, apologies for pronouncing that wrong, using knowledgeably and also perhaps respectfully the Sanskrit word for the steed or vehicle. He adds that ignorance of this vital cultural fact has often led to trouble between British soldiers heedlessly shooting the bird and Indian villagers. He also mentions, I quote, the famous Lucknow case of the wolf boy, unquote, and adds that, quote, India is probably the cradle of the wolf child stories. This, this last may suggest a direct link to the two jungle books by Rudyard, which followed three to four years later. But Lockwood's book has no jungle, no animals in the wild, and only a single mention in passing of a wolf boy, as cited above. Lockwood's book is about the real world, while Rudyard's is all imagination, if not fantasy. Just as Lockwood had provided illustrations to Rudyard's book, Rudyard now provided chapter epigraphs to his father's book, but the effort seems to have been half-hearted, for some chapters bear epigraphs from other authors, some use verses recycled by Rudyard from other contexts, and some have no epigraph at all. The third and final instance of collaboration between them, in fact, involved Rudyard's masterpiece, Kim, the novel which stands as his last and best work on India. That Lockwood provided the illustrations is the most visible part of this deep collaboration, but not the, perhaps the most significant. So we can go back to Kim. Yeah. Father and son got together from time to time over a whole decade, plotting, enriching, and enhancing this novel in various ways. Long after the book was done, Rudyard said with some satisfaction in his published autobiography, quote, there was a good deal of, of beauty in it and not a little wisdom the best in both sorts being owed to my father." Unquote. This is as handsome as it gets, but it is also rather vague. Rajard said he and his father together had smoked the novel into shape, and there is indeed a, a smokescreen that they erected to hide precisely who did what. As it happened, Harish stumbled upon a concrete instance he writes, when I was researching for a new edition of Kim, which Penguin Classics had commissioned me to do, I went and examined the manuscript of Kim that Rudyard had bequeathed to the British Library in London. I found that the chapter in it was considerably thinner than in the published version. Whole chunks of the detailed description of Buddhist sculptures in the Lahore Museum were missing in the manuscript in Rudyard's own hand. It is a fair surmise that these were filled in later by the painter Lockwood. The clincher for me was a palpable error in this chapter, in what I found written there in Rudyard's tiny and crabbed hand. A holy figure was referred to as a Padma Samthora. This made no sense to me. I surmise that the word in the manuscript could equally be read as the more plausible Padma Samphava, the first propagator of Buddhism in Tibet, where the Lama comes from. This nonsensical error had persisted over numerous reprints and successive editions for over a hundred years, including the definitive edition revised and supervised by Rudyard himself in his last years. Probably he himself did not know that this was an error, and Lockwood, the one person who could have corrected it, was long gone. There's, and, um, just a reminder of the Buddhism sculpture in the Lahore Museum, uh, which uh, Lockwood um, catalogued and bought books on Buddhism in order to understand and hence became quite an, an expert in, in the subject. When, though Rudyard as a schoolboy in England had been impacted by a wave of enthusiasm for Buddhism which had swept through the West in the 1870s and 1880s, 
His father had become a real expert on Buddhism after his arrival in Lahore and his appointment as curator of the museum there. This museum became the main depository for some of the finest pieces of Buddhist sculpture recently recovered from the Gandhara area, and the translations into English and French of some key Buddhist texts then being published are proudly displayed in the novel to the Lama by the curator. The cura in, in fiction, the curator actually shows the visiting Lama um, some of these books. Uh, the curator, of course, being fondly modelled by Rudyard on his father, the real-life occupant of that office. If a lot of what Rudyard knew about Buddhism went quietly and invisibly into Rudyard's novel, Rudyard returned the compliment by portraying the curator proudly and unmistakably as being his own father. The opening chapter of Kim stands as a rare testimony to a father and son team collaborating together to e each other's advantage in fact and fiction. This is filial admiration sublimated to the level of the artistic sublime. So to conclude, in our post-colonial age, Rudyard Kipling's abiding reputation as a great writer is in inevitably accompanied by his notoriety as an imperialist and a jingoist. Now that Lockwood too has the beginnings of a posthumous reputation, it may be worth asking if his name is solid in any way through association with his son's negative reputation. It is said that the sins of fathers are visited on the heads of their children. In this case, is there a possibility of the sins of the son being visited on the head of the father? It turns out that this is an unfounded fear for the good reason that in his time Lockwood was as much of an imperialist in his own right as Rajard was later to become in his turn. Several contributors to the book of the exhibition attest to this. Deborah Swallow calls Lockwood, I quote, undoubtedly an agent of the empire, unquote. Julius Bryant refers to Lockwood's, I quote, expressly imperialist attitudes, unquote. And Sandra Kemp goes further to speak of his, quote, conservative and racist imperialist views. It may, however, be unjust to suggest that such attitudes and views were another gift of Lockwood's to Rudyard for two reasons. First, most Englishmen in India of those times shared these views, though this is not really an excuse. Secondly, the saving grace in this case of the Kiplings was, was that both father and son also had a special appreciation of some aspects of India and even sympathy with them, which was exceptional. Rudyard, in a poem of his, spoke of himself as a man who had been granted, I quote, two separate sides to my head. It's a Rudyard poem of that name. In a forthcoming novel on the Kiplings by an author who, is, who also happens to be one of India's top psych psychoanalysts, Sudhir Kakar, a dinner party is described at the Kipling home in Lahore, at which Lockwood speaks out this poem as if it were his own in Rudyard's presence. The implication is that not only the son but the father too was a man with two separate sides to his head. So far as the Indian Empire was concerned, there was between Lockwood and Rudyard not an identity of views but a similar duality of views, which further perhaps deepened the bond between them. Thank you, Harish.